Good morning. Thanks for joining us online again this Sunday. Uh, I hope, honestly, I hope that most of you are choosing this platform uh, because even though we are uh, opening on a, with a very limited worship service and spaced out seating and as many precautions as we can take uh, in the sanctuary and fellowship hall this morning, uh, I, I'm honestly hoping that we don't get a whole lot of folks because uh, it's still kind of nerve wracking, but uh, please be in prayer for, uh, for us as we do that. And uh, I know you have been, but please continue to be in prayer as we discern how to move forward. I uh, hope that this morning finds you well as we are in the last of our sermons on the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. So again, thanks for tuning in. Um, you might get a little bit of a head start if you're tuning in early in the morning uh, compared to the folks who are coming in at nine o'clock. Regardless, we are using the same liturgy and y'all get to sing. Uh, we are not having congregational singing, so uh, feel free to sing along when, uh, when we get to the music here in this YouTube service. Join me, please, in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
invites us to acknowledge and confess our sins. It's an invitation that we can receive and accept confidently because we know that in Christ he has offered forgiveness. He has paid the price for our sins and reconciled us to himself. With that in mind, let us go to God in confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Hear our prayers as we continue our confession in silence. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, and we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, will you join me in the assurance of pardon? The truth may be difficult, but Jesus speaks it with love. He has taken our sin upon himself and called us to repent. God gives forgiveness and offers transformation. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned, this is our final of four Sundays on Jesus's parable of the talents found in Matthew 25. It's verses 14 through 30. I will start as I have been with the scripture passage, so let me pray before I read it. Heavenly Father, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive your word so that we may seek your will. Encourage us, challenge us, fortify us, for the world in which we live, so that we may be bearers of your good news, confident in your gifts. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. 
For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is the fourth and final Sunday in our series on this parable that Jesus told his disciples not long before his death. There are four characters in the story. Each week, I focused on one of the characters. Today is the day that we focus on the main character of the story, the master. Why is the master the main character? Well, aside from having the most speaking parts, the master represents God. Jesus told this story in response to his disciples asking him about his return, asking when he would come back, when God's kingdom would come in full, how would they know to look out for it? So the master in this story really represents Jesus. Even when the master went away on a long journey, he was still the main character in the story. In the story, even when the master was away, it was his talents that were being put to use. Or in the case of the third servant, not being put to use. For the first two servants, the master was still the main character in their lives, even when he was away. It was, it was his gift that was driving their lives. For the third servant, he hid that gift and the master's authority and responsibility he had given him away. Perhaps the biggest difference between the first two servants and the last one was this. While the first two servants were away, they realized that their stewardship of what the master had given was their service. He was still their main character. The third servant hid the money away legally absolving himself of any responsibility for it if it became lost or stolen. And the servant, I guess, took the whole time off. Maybe that's the reason the master says, you wicked and slothful servant. What was he doing while the master was away? His job was to be a servant, but whom was he serving? The master was away, and the third servant had washed his hands of what the master had given him. So while the first two servants still behaved as if the master was the main character in their lives, the third servant behaved as if the main character was himself. So now the question is, is Jesus the main character in our lives? That's a challenge he's making to his disciples. How will we be behaving if he were? How will we be behaving if he were not? Is Jesus the main character 
in our lives, so much so that the gifts he's given us compel us to continue serving him. Now, I can't imagine that any of us always manage to act as if Jesus is the main character in our lives. We all have moments, maybe hours, days, years, seasons of life when we probably act more like the third servant than the first two. The good news is that time and life are among the gifts that God has given us. And the greatest gift that God has given us is Jesus. And this means that no matter where we are or if we are on that third servant journey in some way, we can always turn around and receive that gift, accept that gift. That's what the word repent means, turn around. We can always repent, turn toward Jesus and use the gifts that he's given us. Of course, we also have times when we try to act like the first two servants, but we don't exactly double our investment. When that happens, we can take encouragement that when the master returned, he didn't reward the first two servants because of the amount that they earned or the return that they got on what he had given them. He rewarded them because of their attitude. Their faithful stewardship was not in the doubling of what the master had given them, but in using it putting it to work, and remaining the master's servants even when he was away. So when they return, when he returns, the master says, enter into the joy of your master, which is seeing his work done. After all, if the master was worried about the servants squandering his money, would he have given it to him in the first place? He wanted to see them put his gifts to work. He would have done like he had said to the third servant if he was really worried and just given it to the bankers to loan out at interest. But the master wanted to entrust his money to the servants. He wanted the servants to go to work with it. The master wanted the servants to see what it was like to have and use those gifts. Those gifts were so large, as I mentioned over the past few weeks, one talent would be about $300,000 today. The master had that and so much more. He wanted his servants to understand the joy of being able to put that to work, not just for their own benefit or his benefit, but for the benefit of so many. In other words, the master wanted the servants to share in his joy. Here's how the master responds to the first two servants. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with small things. Now I will put you in charge of great things. Enter into the joy of your master. Of course, this begs the question, what is the master's joy? And that is seeing his work done. Seeing his name become known. Seeing his gifts expand. Well, is that a pattern? Is that a theme that God has given us? The joy at seeing his work done? Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the story. All the way back to the beginning of the Bible. We have God creating the world. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis, we have the days of creation. At the end of each of those days, God looked at what he had created. And what did he think of it? Well, he saw that it was good. And then on the sixth day, here's what happened. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number." Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, 
the sixth day. Moving on to the next chapter, we're told that on the seventh day, God rested. And a few verses later, we're told this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. From the very beginning, God saw that what he had made was good. Then he entrusted us and told us to work it. He entrusted it to us and told us to work it. So in Jesus' story that we've been studying this month, putting the master's gifts to work was not just what the first two servants did in response to the master. It was an acknowledgement of God's original purposes. In fact, we might even say that it was a return to what God had wanted us to do with the gifts he had given us in the first place. Now, what about the third servant? Well, let's consider what happened back in the garden. Back at the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord in the garden, walking in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. That's the third servant right there. That's the third servant. Jesus is not just telling the story about a few servants and their master. He's telling the story of creation, of how God intended his gifts to be used and how sin causes us to be fearful and hide from using them. Moreover, Jesus is telling the story of a new creation, one in which we are not just given a garden and told to eat or not eat from a tree, but one in which we are given Jesus, who nourishes us and gives us new permission to do his work, to use his gifts, to spread his good news. So what did God do at the end of Genesis 3? He expelled Adam and Eve from the garden. They couldn't be in the garden anymore because they were given a choice between God and something else, and they chose something else. That kind of life can't hold up in the garden. So while, yes, God kicked them out of the garden, they had made the choice themselves. They had rebelled, they had sinned, and they were out. Fast forward that to the story that Jesus tells. What happened to the third servant? Well, instead of putting the master's gifts to work, he hid them in the ground. He was afraid, and he hid what the master had given him. He chose to stop being the master's servant. When the master came back, the third servant said, I hid your gifts because I was afraid. So what happened? The master expelled the third servant from the household. I'm sensing a pattern here. So let's go a little deeper. What happened when Adam and Eve chose something else over God? Sin happened. It played out in their two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was jealous of Abel and killed him, and sin, distrust, and alienation from one another became the rule of life. So why did the third servant hide the money? Well, yes, he was afraid, but why? I mentioned this last week. But at the time Jesus was telling this story, there was a law in place that said that if you were entrusted with a sum of money and it got stolen or you lost it, then you were responsible. But if you hid it in the ground and it was taken, you were not responsible. 
So what was the third servant doing? He was just trying to keep the money safe from thieves. He was trying to keep the master's gift safe from sin. In fact, that was one of the main purposes of the Jewish law that accommodated things like the third servant's actions, to protect people from sin. They had oriented their lives around being afraid of sin, so much so that they didn't feel free to go and use the gifts that God had given. They had oriented their lives around that fear of sin. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing in theory, but it can also lead to operating out of fear, even if that fear is of other people's sins. That's what was on the third servant's mind. So instead of being governed by his responsibility to the master, the third servant was governed by fear. But just like Adam, he got expelled from the garden, the household. His attitude was not conducive to being a servant of the master. Now, if that sounds like a little bit of unfair treatment for the third servant, then consider how this sounded to Jesus' listeners. To them, the first two servants weren't necessarily doing the wrong thing, but they were taking a big risk, putting the master's money to work in the ways that they understood to be proper. Out in the world, out in the world, no less, they would have understood, people at Jesus' time would have understood the third servant's apprehensions. But the master's responses to each of these servants might have been an even bigger shock to them. Not only did the master chastise the third servant for hiding the money, he even suggested giving it to the banks to loan out an interest. Jews weren't supposed to charge interest to other Jews. So that meant that Jesus was endorsing the use of the master's gifts by people who were not part of the isolated, selective club. Jesus was willing for his gifts to be put to use in the world in general. Just as surprising, though, would have been the master's invitation to the first two servants. Come and share in your master's joy. Enter into the joy of your master. That would have been a shock. These were servants. The master wasn't just offering them more responsibility. He was offering them a place at his table to know what it was like to be him. The master was inviting them to take on his own status, almost as if he was inviting them back into the garden, redeeming them, reconciling them to himself. Adam and Eve and the third servant all had attitudes that showed that they were not capable of living in the garden or the household. But the way Jesus tells this story, the first two servants had, had attitudes that showed that they were capable of living in the garden, in the household of the master. Jesus was saying, that the door to that household is open again. And that the master, that Jesus himself takes joy in seeing the gifts that he's given used. In fact, Jesus is the one who opens the door by paying for our sins, by offering forgiveness for sins, by inviting us to turn around and repent, to turn back around to him. We can choose to live in fear and apprehension, or we can choose to get back to our original purpose, putting to work the gifts that God entrusts to us. The master's joy is the use of the gifts. The master's joy is seeing his servants use his gifts as people whom he has redeemed. Now, the world today is not exactly the Garden of Eden, but Jesus is also saying that we don't have to be in the garden to have God as the main character in our lives. Likewise, we don't have to wait for heaven to know what it's like to share in God's joy. We can share in God's joy by using his gifts and seeing the fruit that they bear, by investing the gifts that he's given in his work. In order to do so, we have to work to make Jesus the main character in our lives. That's not easy. It's something we have to practice. And if we think about it, we probably put other people and other things at the center of our lives all the time. Maybe we put our 
spouse or our kid or our favorite team or our work or simply ourselves at the center. When those people and things experience joy, we experience joy, right? We share in their joy. And of course, God has given us all of those people and things, and God is at work in all of them. But the reality is that at some point, all of those people and things in which we might place our joy, where we might center our lives, they're all going to let us down in some way. So we could base our lives on them, or we could base our lives on the one who gave them to us. We try to build our lives so often around the gifts that God has given, but we should be building our lives around the giver. If you build your life around the giver, then you're going to appreciate the gift so much more. And you're going to share in the joy that the giver has in giving it. Even when all the things that we try to put at the centers of our lives let us down, God is still giving us gifts. They don't even have to be tangible gifts or obvious talents either. They could be blessings like health and friends and family and time. Those are things that have been very apparent to us over the past couple of months. How are we using each of those things for God? How can we see his joy in them? How are we working with the gifts that God has given? How are we sharing the master's joy in giving them? Sharing in God's joy means knowing that he wants to give us gifts and he wants us to use them. Above all, it means knowing that he has given us the gift of his son, Jesus, who gives us the freedom to work in his name with his gifts, his inexhaustible love and grace. If Jesus is the main character in our lives, then we will know his joy in the things that give him joy. But if that might sound a bit theoretical or esoteric, then there's a practical place to begin. We can begin with gratitude. What has God given us? How do we see his joy in those gifts? How can we work in those gifts, with those gifts, in ways that give us even more joy at seeing the master's work be done? How can we keep serving the master? Even though we know he is close to us in the Holy Spirit, that Jesus still leads us, even when he might seem far away. Do we see God's joy in hiding our gifts, absolving ourselves from their risk and use? Or do we see his joy in using the gifts he's given, loving the gifts he's given us? Are we asking God to help us use those gifts for his sake? Are we sharing in God's joy? Are we making the most of the gifts that God has given? Are we making the most of the gift of Jesus, who gave his life, his great gift, so that we may know his joy. As you go out from here, as you consider the stewardship of all the gifts that God has given you, not just you know, pledging and giving to the church, but all the gifts that he's given, the ways that he could be at work through your use of those gifts, Count your blessings and know that God's joy in giving them to you and seeing you use them for his sake is his great desire. His great desire that you may know those gifts and in them know his great gift of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, let us take stock of the gifts you have given. Let us know that whether we may count many or few right now, we've got the greatest gift of Jesus, his sacrifice, his new life, the redemption that he offers. 
Give us joy in that and let us find joy in all the other gifts through him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Now will you join me in saying our affirmation of faith. Heidelberg Catechism, question one, once again. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. At the cost of his own blood, he has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. He protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Friends, I look forward to seeing you more and more as the weeks go by. But I continue to pray that you are well, that we are well, that we can see God's work through this, that we can share in his joy, maybe even recognizing gifts that we had ignored or not fully understood. When we are able to come back together more and more, let us share the joy that God has of giving us the gift of one another. As you go, may the hands of Christ tend your wounds. May the Holy Spirit bring to your minds just the things that you need to hear. May you dwell in the Father's arms at the last. Amen.